Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. What a privilege, what an honor it is for us to be here again with another edition of our Rayma Encounter. We are so blessed and so privileged and grateful to God for granting us another opportunity to be here. We apologize for the late start. We had a little, uh, we had some, some issues we needed to attend to that kind of held us up for a bit. But thanks be to God, we are here and ready to begin. As usual, um, the songs we're going to play today, we have no copyright to these songs. And so we are asking Facebook and YouTube um, not to hold it against us. All right. Don't hold it against us. Okay. Don't hold it against us. We have no copyright. We have no copyright to these songs, Facebook and YouTube. So we are excited to be here on tonight. We are continuing and concluding our study on the filling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week we did um, we did some work in trying to explain what it means to be filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit, and in the eventuality that our person, you know, is not experiencing the filling of the Holy Spirit tonight, we're focusing on what can you do. If the, if the Bible speaks of the feeling as something that can happen, does it imply then that one can lose that feeling? And if we lost that feeling, what can be done to regain or, re, or become refilled with the Spirit of God? And so we are grateful tonight. We're excited to be on here tonight. Share the link. Uh, please share the link and let us um, expect God to do great things in the midst of God's people tonight in Jesus' name. Um, please share the link. Please share the link. Please share the link. We have no copyright to this song. We have no copyright to the song. Facebook and YouTube, we have no copyright to the song. We have no copyright to the song. Facebook and YouTube don't. A song by Nathaniel Bassi, Adonai. I love this song. You'll hear me play it a number of times. Adonai is, is the Hebrew for the word Lord, because indeed God is the possessor of the ends of the earth. The Lord our God reigns. The Lord our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And it's just such a comforting song. You know, in the midst of the news of all the crazy things happening around the world, the you know, on the one hand, you think that a coronavirus is 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 is, is diminishing. On another hand, you hear that it seems like it's spiking again. Um, you listen, and there is about monkeypox, and you listen to, to the crisis in the world and the inflation. It's such a comfort to know that God is still Lord, that that None of these circumstances and situations um, um, will, will, will dethrone God. None of these things will, 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 will cause God to diminish in God's power and God's splendor. And so I, I just, I just, it's such a comforting song. And I hope and pray that it blesses you in Jesus' name. We bless God for this privilege. We bless God for this honor. Amen. We bless God for this privilege and this honor to be here tonight. So please do us this favor, share the link, and we're going to jump straight into business. Amen. Be hollow. Somebody say, I don't know. Just say, I. I I don't know. I don't I don't Lord, we worship you tonight. We just thank you for being God in the midst of everything. We thank you that God, you are our calm in the midst of the storm. We just worship you tonight. Yes, God, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, your name, your name, God, your name is so worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Your name is to be hollow. Somebody say, I don't know. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same.
Okay, we apologize for that glitch. I do not know what happened. We apologize for that glitch. I do not know what happened. I just know that we were momentarily off for, for a minute. Okay, so we are on. We are back on. We are back on. If you are on, please give us your feedback. Let us know you're there. If you're on, please give us your feedback so that we are confident that you are there. We are sure that you are there. And we're getting ready to start. Amen. Okay. Jesus, you are worthy. You are so worthy. There is none like you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your loving kindness. Oh, God, you're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. So if you're there, please just um, give us... Give us a feedback so that we know that you are there, please. Just give us your feedback. Just comment so that we know that you're there. Just give us your comment. Give us your comment. Give us your comment. Give us your feedback so that we know you're there. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Wonderful counselor. So we, we're going to begin with a word of prayer and then we jump straight into business in Jesus. And Father, we thank you for tonight. We come before you broken, humble, empty. And Father God, we come, Lord, in desperate need of mercy. We come in desperate need of grace. We come in desperate need of touch tonight. We come, Lord, saying, Father, we are vulnerable, vulnerable with you in this space. We come say, Lord, we are open to you. We come say, Holy Spirit, just do a new thing in our hearts tonight. Do a new thing in our life tonight. Do a new thing in this space tonight. That, Father God, we can truly experience you on another level. That, God, our spirits can find rest in you, O God. Touch us now, God, in our broken places. Touch us, Lord, in the areas of our frailties. Touch us in the areas of our pain. Father God, remold us and remake us so that, Lord, we can be acceptable carriers of your spirit and worthy of an overfilling from you, God. Teach us tonight, Holy Spirit. You are our teacher. You are our comforter. We need your help tonight. Showcase the splendor of Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father God, in the end, Lord, just bless somebody, Lord, like only you can. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. <clears throat> Amen. So we don't have copyright to these songs. Um, this is a song by Nathaniel Bassi. See what the Lord has done. We are discussing the filling of the Holy Spirit, and as we as we do so, we will begin by this um, by um, reading our focal passage, Ephesians chapter five. Our focal passage is Ephesians the fifth chapter. <laughs> Ephesians chapter number five, and we will look at verse 18. For the sake of context, we'll begin reading at verse number 15, as we did last week. Paul writes to the Ephesian believers, and he writes to us, and he makes this declaration. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
In verse 18, our key passage, he says, and do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's verse 20. Uh, verse 21, submitting yourselves to one another out of reverence for God. And then he, he begins with the, the marital instructions. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord and all that. But our focal passage is verse number 18. Do not get drunk with wine, but I mean, which is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. We dealt with it last week, so we will not um, we will not go into. We will not go back and do a complete recap like we said last week. We can rather share the link in the comment section so that if you need if you need to pick up on where we were where we left off on last week by the grace of god you can easily do that you can easily follow from from there praise the lord so um so we we, we the question the question i was asked is, is this if the Holy Spirit, if if the encouragement from the scriptures is do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, does that imply, the question is, does that imply that at some point we can, you know, perhaps not be filled with the Holy Spirit and basically be empty of the Holy Spirit? That's the question. Can we, can we, can we, you know, not be filled with the Holy Spirit? And if we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, we give God the glory for you, Mother Priscilla. She's on here. Welcome. All right. So the link, the link from last week is on here as well. Thank God for you. The link from last week is on here. It's in a, it's in a section, in the comment section there. And all you have to do is to click on our link and then you can get the information from last week. All right. So the question is, when the Bible says be filled with the Holy Spirit, also you can look at other references. Paul, I mean, the Dr. Luke writes in Acts, in Acts chapter 4, he writes and he mentions that the believers, when they had prayed, for instance, the place where they were was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Um... It's Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 8 of Acts chapter 4. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, and Peter filled with the Holy Spirit says to them, rulers of the people and elders, if you are, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man is healed, then let it be known to all of you and the people of Israel that it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man, this man is standing before you. You know the story. They were, you know, told not to prophesy in the name of Jesus anymore. But the Bible says when they left their group and they came back to their to their company, when they came back to their fellow uh, the fellow believers, from beginning at verse twenty three, when they had released them, they went back to their friends, reported to the, to the, to their colleagues, their fellow believers, everything that the high priest and the chief priest had said to them. Basically, don't ever preach in the name of Jesus, right? The text says, but they prayed, they lifted up their voices and they prayed to God, the sovereign. And they said, sovereign Lord, you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They go and pray. And the Bible says, and the text says that verse 31 says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with great boldness. Hmm. They were all filled with the Spirit. They were all filled with the Spirit. And they began to preach or to speak the word of God with great boldness. Now, 
that the scripture will mention that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The question is, so does that imply that at some point, you know, a person may or may not be filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that the question? And if if one is not filled with the Spirit, if one is not filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, then then what is the hope? What is the possibility of that person being refilled? Amen. Amen. Um, my dearest is on here, Francis Carly. We bless God for you, dear. Praise God for you in Jesus' name. There are several, there are many, many references. There are many references. Some of those references, when you look at them, it, it would appear like the filling of the Holy Spirit is like a passive thing that we have no agency in a matter. There is nothing we can do. We just are recipients. For instance, um, the baby in the womb of Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit from, from birth. In that case, the baby had nothing to do to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The baby only had to be a recipient of it. But from the Acts passage that we read, the scripture tells us that when they had prayed, the place they were, and if you look at what they were even praying, they were praying that they will be empowered to do more of what God wanted them to do rather than being pressured to, 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 to compromise what God had called them to do. Amen? Rather than to have them compromise what God had called them to do. Amen? So, the question again is, so, is it can a person be refilled with the Holy Spirit? And if that is the case, how can that filling of the Holy Spirit be regained? How can that refilling of the Holy Spirit be regained? Well, one thing I want to register to us tonight is this. Again, don't forget that when we speak about the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's not like you're pouring water in a cup and the cup is increasing. The filling of the Holy Spirit, the experience of the filling of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily, the filling of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily, um, the filling of the Holy Spirit is not necessarily that we have more of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is perfect in who the Holy Spirit is. There is no way you can add to or subtract from the Holy Spirit in any way. But when we speak of the filling of the Holy Spirit, remember now, we're saying that the filling of the Holy Spirit is rather that the Spirit of God has more of us. The Spirit of God has more control of us. We are able to avail ourselves to God in a manner that God has prescribed so that by reason of our surrender to God, the Spirit of God picks us up and carries us. To the point that we think the thoughts of Christ, to the point that we we speak the words of Christ, to the point that we act the activities of Christ, we implement the activities of Christ. So that in the filling of the Holy Spirit, again, is not so much that we have more of the Holy Spirit, but rather that the Holy Spirit has more of us so much so that Christ can be revealed in us. Now, on that basis, what we are saying basically is this, that the filling of the Holy Spirit is, is, is the work of God, is the work of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer on the one hand, but on the other hand, from what the Scripture has shown, from what the Bible has shown and from what we're going to be looking at, we will see that there is a part that we have to play. There's a part that we have to play, okay? Now, on that basis, let's look at some things. First of all, it is important to understand the foundation, first of all, for the interaction with the Holy Spirit. What is the basis by which a person can even interact with the Holy Spirit? The, the foundation upon which one can interact with the Holy Spirit, the foundation upon which one can experience the power of the Holy Spirit in, in, in granting us that grace to function the way God wants us to function, begins by knowing God's method of forgiveness and God's method of cleansing through the blood of Jesus. With that said, let us look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. This is the this is the this is the instruction from the scriptures. Listen to what John, John writes to the believers. He says, John writes to the believers and he says. However, if we walk 
I want to just put it up on the screen. However, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So remember now, when we're talking about the losing, rather, of the Holy Spirit or the grieving of the Holy Spirit, we said, you know, the Holy Spirit will, will get grieved or the Holy Spirit will get quenched when the Holy Spirit is telling us something not to do and we end up doing it. Don't do this and we end up doing it. You quench the Holy Spirit, right? And if the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something and you're refusing to do that thing, you continually, you, you will quench, the you will, you will grieve the Holy Spirit's heart. And we say when that happens... The relationship is not terminated, but the fellowship becomes broken. So when we said that, the basis for that statement was rooted in the foundation by which we can interact with God and we can interact with the Holy Spirit. So there, the word of God says, if we walk in the light, the word, the phrase walk in the light is an indication, is a, is a it's another way of saying is is a is a is a, a figurative way of saying if we live within the light of God's presence. Because listen, God has an expectation of how we must live our lives. God has an expect. I said it. I said it like this: that that we are never saved without a purpose. The Jesus never went to the cross of Calvary to die for the for for sinners for no reason. Christ was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the enemy. We know that for the son of man, you know, has come, but for to seek and to save the lost. So there is a purpose for redemption. We also said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, verse 8 says, we are saved by grace through faith. It's not by, or by works, lest any man should boast, right? But verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now, I'm saying this to say that God has a pattern. God has a prescription. God has a mandate. God has a, a demand. God has a blueprint for how we carry ourselves, how we function when we come into the kingdom of God by reason of the blood of Jesus. It's important to not miss that. So, again, the word of God is very clear. The scripture says, if we walk in the light, as Christ is in the light, as God our Father is in the light, then we can say, if we walk, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship, first of all. That means if we are not walking in the light, we cannot guarantee that we have a fellowship with God. The word of God will not be broken for you or for me. If we must have fellowship with the Father, we must walk in the light. We said walking in the light is another way of just saying living according to the pattern that God has said. Basically, living in obedience to God. I like the way Jesus said it. He said, he said, he said, um, light, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. But what? People love darkness rather than light. People love darkness rather than light. And that is a strong statement. But again, I know when Jesus says it, it is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. All right. It is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So, the, so, so. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. There is a demand to walk in the light. There is a, a demand to walk in the light. And I, 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 I think this is going to help us to understand something. The psalmist said that the word of God is a lamp Unto our feet and a light on is a light is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So we can safely conclude that walking in the light is walking in the light of God's word, walking in obedience to God's word. Because prior to our coming into the into relationship with God, prior to that, we were bosses unto ourselves. We lived our life anyhow. We 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 acted based on feelings. Whatever felt good was what we did. But now that we came to the place of realizing that living by feelings is often detrimental. Why? For there is a way that seems right unto a person, but the end thereof is destruction. Thus, 
we came, the Spirit of God opened our eyes to make us understand our need for Jesus, how desperate we are without the mercies of God. And we came crying and asking God to redeem us, to have mercy upon us and bring us into the family of God. When we started that relationship with God, we now need the light of God's word so that we can live. Why? Because the just shall live by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how does a person, how will a person live in the light? That person lives in the light by living in or, or living under the directive and the, and the mandate of God's instruction. If, again, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we can say that we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So walking in obedience, especially for someone who has had a relationship with God, especially for someone who claimed that he or she has, you know, has been touched by the, by the mercies of God, that someone who can claim that I have tasted of the mercy of God, if you can claim that, the, the, the evidence, the evidence of showing that you have fellowship with God, the evidence that we have fellowship with God is the fact that the scripture says we walk in obedience to God. We walk in the light as he is in the light. And then we can guarantee that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all, from all sin. So, so if we must, if we must even trust the Holy Spirit to help us live in the light, it begins by knowing this important truth that God's method of forgiveness is through the blood and by reason of the blood, now that we have been cleansed, if we do not walk in the light, if we do not walk under the directive of the word, guess what? There is a possibility that we can go back and continue to get messy again, get messed up again, where it will almost be like we are nailing Christ to the cross afresh. where we are crucifying the Lord afresh. I like the way Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 6 put it. He says, They have fallen away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they are crucifying the Son of God for themselves, and they are publicly holding him, him in contempt. Again, there is a purpose. Understand there is a purpose. Jesus went to the cross for redeeming us, for forgiving us. And if we claim that we have tasted of the mercy of God, then God's requirement is that we walk in the light. And we say walking in the light. I don't want you to miss this point. Walking in the light means walking in obedience to the word. Because again, the word is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path. Again, the word of God tells us that the just, those who have been justified by grace through faith, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as we walk in obedience to God, we are walking in the light. So, so, so understand that if we have been cleansed, understand that if we have been cleansed. Wow, Sister Freeman is on here. Sister Natosha Freeman is on here all the way from Syracuse, New York. Bless God for you. Welcome. It's good to have you on here. All right. So the, the foundation begins, the foundation is to begin by knowing that God's method of forgiveness is not by any other means. It's not by going to church. It's not by fasting. It's not by praying, but it's by the blood of the Lamb. It's because of the sacrifice that Jesus rendered, that Jesus offered, that Jesus made, the perfect sacrifice on the cross. Because his blood was shed, his life was given. Life is in the blood. It is on our basis that forgiveness can be, accept, can be accessed. And the person who accesses, who accesses the mercy of God, you are capable of of receiving revelation from god so i mean so as to know what to do and more than that you are capable of you are you are you are able to receive the power of god's spirit to help you to accomplish what god reveals to us all right so number one knowing the method of god's forgiveness and god's cleansing which is the blood of jesus that is the beginning that's the starting place to understand if we can if the refilling must happen don't underestimate why jesus went to the cross because it's almost going to be like we are cleansed from a particular sickness and then we go back and plunge ourselves into it again and get, and get reinfected. And then we come back again, we get cleansed and we keep, we keep going back. It doesn't, it doesn't, it almost, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive. You're like, but well, why are you doing that? There is a purpose for which Christ went to the cross. The purpose was for cleansing. 
He went to the cross for forgiveness. He went to the cross for making us whole. He went to the cross for making us truly come alive. He went to the cross for making us to be able to live our true selves, live like the sons and daughters of the most high God that we are. Praise the Lord. So it's imperative. It's important to understand this. But number two, to also know that God's means, so the method of forgiveness and God's cleansing is through the blood. But now the means of forgiveness and cleansing has to be through heartfelt, sincere repentance. Are you hearing what I just said? The, the means... Uh, the method, the me, the method that was the method, the divine method that was instituted to guarantee that we can receive forgiveness and cleansing, the blood. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood. Amen. We sing this over and over. We sing the blood of Jesus will never lose his power. But now I'm saying this because just because the blood is available, just because the blood is eternally effective and the blood will and the efficacy of the blood will never lose his power. That does not automatically mean that every individual will just receive forgiveness. No, that's it it not how it works. Now, what does the scripture teach about the means of forgiveness, about God's prescribed means of forgiveness? We're in 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse we're at verse 7. Now, go down to verse 9 and you'll see it. I don't, I'm not making this stuff up. So, again, let's start reading from verse 7. Verse 7 says, however, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then... We can claim that we have fellowship one with another, and we can also claim that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. Not church membership. Church membership will not cleanse. Not knowing the pastor is not going to cleanse you. Not um, turning over a new leaf personally by yourself is not going to cleanse you. But the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial death on the cross, is the, is, is the method that, that God has instituted by which we can receive forgiveness. Now, Knowing that this is the reality, the question then is, but how can I apply it to myself? If I'm going to apply it to myself, God shows us, God gives us the answer. Verse 8, he says, if we say that we, if we say that we do not have a sin in us, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So then if Christ died for our sins, then the question is, but if he, if he died for our sins, then how can we say that we still have sin in us, right? Because here, this beloved, salvation is three-dimensional. Salvation is from God's, the blood of Jesus Christ saves us from the penalty of sin. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. No condemnation, right? So God's salvation provides us redemption from the penalty of sin. We will not face the consequence of eternal damnation in the lake of burning fire according to the word of God. We are being saved from the from the from the, the power of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. What does that mean? Sin exercised authority over us from before we met Jesus. The good we wanted to do, we didn't do. The evil we didn't want to do, we kept finding ourselves doing it, which was a proof, which was evidence that sin was present with us. Because sin is in the fleshly nature. It is in this fleshly nature that keeps pulling us away from the nature of God. Pulling us away from the will of God. It is because of the fleshly nature. This thing inside of us. This I call it the Adamic pandemic. It's because of this Adamic pandemic that we, we don't. Honest, if we are honest with ourselves, we don't. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We are 365 days in a year. We are not. We are not super happy to do the will of God. In fact, sometimes doing the will of God can be something, can almost be a struggle for us. Why? Because it's an uphill battle. That lingering presence of sin is still there. The effectiveness, I mean, the effect of the flesh is still there. It's still yearning. It's still pulling us. All right? But sin, I mean, salvation, the salvation that God provides is not just, again, not just a redemption, not just a deliverance from the penalty of sin. Not just that salvation is being, we are being delivered from the presence, I mean, excuse me, from the power and the control of sin, which is why we need the Holy Spirit. Because sin's control will pull you, the flesh control will pull you, if not, if the Holy Spirit don't exert power in your life for you and I to overcome it. It will pull us back. And then 
salvation is, is the third dimension of salvation is that God will at one in a not too distant future. We don't know the exact date, but we know that Christ will come back for the church. Christ will come back to liberate his own and we will be redeemed from the presence of sin where we will eternally be with the Lord. All right. Now, we said this because the word of God says, so, I mean, I was just to give you a clarity of what verse eight means, that if we say that we do not have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth, truth is not in us. So Paul said the evil, the good I don't want to do, I don't do, but the evil I don't want to do, I keep finding myself doing it, which is an indication that sin is residing in me. I inherited it from my, from, from my lineage. Psalm, Psalm 51 and verse five, he says, he says, he says, he says, he said, I was shaping in sin and in iniquity that my mother conceived me. So while God has dealt with it, while God is dealing with it, and while God will ultimately deal with it, the, the residue effect is still is still alive today. And this is the reason why we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. But now, verse 9 says, and if we confess our sins. He, meaning God, is number one, faithful, and number two, righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from every unrighteousness. So the means by which we can receive God's forgiveness is by heartfelt, genuine, sincere confession. Heartfelt, genuine sincere confession if we confess that's what the word of god says if we confess god is faithful and just to forgive us right this word confess on my logo on my logio on my home oh homologio it means to say the same thing as another or to agree or to consent that's what the word means so to confess means that the the spirit of God or the word of God is convicting me that I should not have told a lie in this circumstance, but I told a lie. And by reason of me telling that lie, no matter how much I try to rationalize it and justify it in my spirit, the, the, the Lord is convicting me and letting me know that, Victor, this is wrong. It's unacceptable. You should not have done this. And and I can, I can, I can choose to argue with God or I can choose to agree with and accept what god has said that's one that's one one definition of the word con confess another definition of the word confess is to concede if you were in a, if you were taking a court for an allegation for a charge for a crime and the evidence stacks up against you and they ask you how do you plead you can choose to say, well, I see all the evidence, but this is not what it seems to be because this is what was happening. So you can either choose to plead guilty, which means I concede, I accept the evidence and a charge against me, or you can say, no, I'm not guilty. And then you can bring evidence to show counter. But we know that when God's word and when God's spirit convicts us about a thing, we know that God is not wrong. So it means to concede. It means to not refuse. It means to not deny, to not cover up. Another definition of that word means to profess, to declare openly and say, God, I messed up. My God. There is one powerful scripture. Again, I want to go back. I want us to go back to it. There's one powerful scripture that helps us to see the beauty of confession. And that Psalm, in the Psalm, Psalm 51 and verse number five. It, it, it's Psalm chapter 51 and verse number five. This is a passage of scripture that mentions or that is that is that is um reported to be about the about the psalmist David after he was convicted of committing adultery with Bathsheba. Conception happened, she became pregnant. He tried to dis to, 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 to be deceptive to cover up his deed by inviting the lady's husband to come from the war front. And then to go and spend some time with his wife, the, the husband never does that. When he realizes that he cannot get this man to sleep with his wife so that it can appear like the conception was caused by the husband, he ends up writing a letter, giving command to the chief, the, the chief of his army, that this guy should be placed in the hottest point of the battle and make sure that this man dies. It was a secret. It was a cover-up. Nobody knew about it. 
except God and his handful of people who were, you know, in the know of things. And you know they were never going to come and confront him. But because God is a righteous God and God revealed this truth to God's servant Nathan and the prophet Nathan confronted him, he accepted, he didn't argue with God. He accepted, he consented, he agreed with the truth of God's word because he knew against God's word. He knew, he knew rather that God's word had a mandate that we should not covet anything that belongs to our neighbor. In this case, he had taken his neighbor's wife. He knew that the word of God also says, do not commit adultery. The woman was not his wife. So sleeping with her, knowing that she was not his wife, was an act of adultery, was a sexual sin. And then to compound it, he now commits murder because killing Uriah was not in self-defense. Uriah did not attack him where he was fighting back to defend himself and Uriah died in the process. No, it was murder because he planned the man's death. He had an intent to destroy the evidence. It was murder. And when a prophet confronted him, listen to what he wrote to God. This was not a song. He was not singing a song. He was not having a beautiful worship experience and just blessing God. No, he was pouring the sincerity of his heart out before God. And this is what he said. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your loving kindness and according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be justified when you speak and that you may be right when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity in, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He is acknowledging, he is agreeing with God that he failed. That he broke, he violated God's word on multiple levels. That although it was an act that hurt people, but ultimately it was an act that broke the heart of God. It was an act that broke the fellowship between himself and God. And if you read further down, you will notice he says, hide not, verse 9, he says, hide not your face from me and hide, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. He says, he says, create in me a clean heart of God. And he says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He says, cast me not away from your presence and do, do not what? Take your Holy Spirit from me. Ooh. Because again, go back to what we said last week. And again, the link is there. He is saying, why is he asking God not to take the Holy Spirit from him? It's not that God is taking his Holy Spirit from him, but it's like the Spirit of God will hush up because we can we can argue that if the Spirit of God was present, yes, the Spirit of God came upon David when he was, when he was anointed to be king of Israel. In Old Testament days, the Spirit of God came upon select individuals to do the will of God. Today, in this New Testament dispensation, because of Christ, the Spirit has come permanently and the Spirit of God is upon every individual, every child of God who gives his or her life to Christ. So the Spirit of God would not leave, or the Spirit of God could leave, rather, because we see that the Spirit of God left Saul and came upon David. He knew. So what is he praying for? He's saying, God, please, by reason of my sin, don't, don't let your Spirit be taken from me. Because we can argue that the Spirit of God may have said to him, don't, you know, don't, don't do this. But apparently he ignored the voice of the Spirit of God. He ignored counsel. He ignored the Word of God that he knew that he should have done. Hit in his heart so that he will not disobey God. And so now he's praying and he's saying, God, do not take, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, I, I, I know that you are mad at me right now. You don't want to talk to me right now. The fellowship has been broken because I broke your heart. I made you mad. I disrespected your word. But God, please do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, confession is is absolutely vital if because because if think about it if you look at a previous lesson if you look at a previous lesson we said the sin of quenching the holy spirit 
First Thessalonians five nineteen is that sin. Is it, is it that sin involved not doing what the Holy Spirit wants me to do? That's a sin of quenching the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit did not want, I mean, the Holy Spirit wants me to do something, and if I'm not doing, that, I'm quenching the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told Peter, told Philip in the Book of Acts, I think it's Acts chapter eight, go and speak to the Ethiopian. You know, if he had refused by not doing what the Spirit of God wanted him to do, he would have hushed up the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God would not speak to him no more on that issue or any other matter until he comes to the point of repentance, which is what we are dealing with right now through confession. Now, the grieving of the Spirit is doing what the Holy Spirit is saying don't do. And that's what we can believe in this case. That's what's happening. Because the Holy Spirit may have been saying to him, don't touch the man wife. He didn't listen. He goes and he commit the act. Conception happened. Now he tries to cover it up. He can't get it covered up. So what is the next thing he tries to do? He kills the man. So now in this case, since the Holy Spirit did not want him to do these things and yet he did it, the Spirit of God was grieved. So he has a right to pray and say, God, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Thus, imagine what you think would have happened if he had just pretended like nothing happened. You think he would ever have received cleansing and forgiveness? Again, the Bible is our guide for us to understand how God will deal with us. But what we see is that he confessed it to God. He cried out to God. He agreed. He said, against you. And you only have us sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He owned up to it. He didn't make excuses. He didn't justify. He didn't try to rationalize his action. He didn't try to, to, to twist and turn and bend the rules and make it seem like, oh, he, because you can fool people. You can even fool yourself. You can never fool God. And so he owns up to it and he accepts it. So confession is absolutely vital for which the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin. And the blood of Jesus will not cleanse us from any excuse. I'll say that again. Confession is absolutely vital because confession will confession through the blood of Christ will cleanse us from every sin. But confession will not cleanse. But but excuses will not will not lead to cleansing. In fact, Proverbs chapter thirteen, uh, twenty three, Proverbs chapter. 23 and I think verse 13. Whoever covers your sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes it will obtain mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever confesses that deed that have gone against God's word, Proverbs 28, 13. The one who covers the sin will not prosper. The one who makes an, an excuse will not, will not find cleansing. You're not going to prosper. But the person who owns up to it and say, God, I, I made a mistake. I sinned against you. I broke your word. However you want to call it, but own up to it and, and, and mean it in your heart. Then we can receive cleansing from the Lord. God does not demand golden vessels, nor does God require silver ones. But God demands a clean vessel. Let me say that again. You don't have to be a golden vessel to be used by God. You don't have to be a silver vessel to be used by God. But we have to be clean vessels to be, to be used by God. We do not have to be vessels of gold or vessels of silver to be used by God. But we have to be vessels that are clean to be used by God. So then the union with the Spirit of God is so strong that nothing can break that union. But understand that the communion, the fellowship with the Holy Spirit is so fragile that sometimes the smallest sin can shatter that fellowship. Which is why it is... See the word. See, look, listen to the to the way it is it is worded. So then, walk in the spirit. Walk in the light, because if we walk in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. In the blood of Jesus, His Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That means I cannot have a sinister agenda against the will and the word of God, against the nature of God, and still claim I'm walking in the light. 
the spirit of God would not be there with me in that place when I'm doing whatever. The word of God is our guide. The word of God is the light that guides us. If we are walking, if we are intentionally walking outside of the mandate of the word of God, guess what? We are breaking the fellowship. We are breaking the fellowship. We are shattering the fellowship. Now, So, so, so with that state, with that state, how can we, how can we experience the, the refilling? Number one, we said, understand that the method by which forgiveness can come is through the blood. Number two, understand that forgiveness can come through confession, but the fullness can come through familiarity and fellowship through prayer and spiritual exercise. Let me say that again. The filling can come after, again, I, I don't want you to miss this. The grieving of the Holy Spirit will happen when the Holy Spirit tells you don't do something, you go do it. The Holy Spirit is grieved. The quenching of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit does not want you to do something, you still go and do it, right? And oftentimes what the Holy Spirit will be mandating you to do or not to do will be in line with the will and the word of God, right? So if for any reason we have grieved the spirit of God or we have quenched the spirit of God by disobedience, either through commission, something that we did that we should not have done, or by omission, something that we should not have done and yet we did, right? By reason of that, it means the spirit of God is no longer actively controlling and talking and guiding us and leading us in that moment. We are controlling ourselves. And if we are genuine and sincere and passionate about God, I promise you this, there will be a nagging sense of conviction that will dog your heart, dog your mind, dog your spirit, that will rob you of your peace, that you cannot find peace by watching movies, you cannot find peace by eating the best of food, you cannot find peace by any form of pleasures. That peace can only be found by the presence of God and by the joy that the Spirit of God brings. So, when that conviction starts to happen, how can you, how can we deal with the corrosion the thing that have blocked the flow of the fellowship the thing that have blocked the flow of the power how can we deal with that so that we can experience the power of god number one know that it has to be dealt with by the blood and i want to say something about this it is imperative to keep reminding ourselves that if we intentionally continue to violate god's word and god's will only because we know that the blood will cleanse us I know Christ was crucified once for all, but the scripture says, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, it's like we are showing insult to the spirit of grace and showing contempt for the blood of Jesus that have shared that have, that have been shed on the cross of, of, of Calvary for our redemption. The blood will cleanse, the blood is forever effective. But beloved, we this is why we need to, if we never prayed about anything, we need to pray constantly that God will open our eyes to see the place that God took us from so that we cannot, it cannot be something that we just want to stay there. That that we can pray, that we can pray passionately and fervently so that God's power can prevail in our life, so that we can lust the appetite, the taste for the leek and the garlic of Egypt. So that we can taste and see that the Lord is good and continue to walk in the in newness of life. Yes, the blood will cleanse number one. Number two, confession. So after we have addressed the corrosion by agreeing with God and say, yes, Holy Spirit, I agree. I should not have spoken to him like the way I spoke to him. I agree that I have been carrying the spirit of unforgiveness in my heart for her all this while. I agree, God, that I, sh I, I should not have, I, I should not have, you know, slandered him or her. I should not have gossiped him or her, right? Your, the light of your word brought conviction to me and I, I agree with you, right? And I'm sorry about this. My spirit is crushed. My spirit is broken because God, I hurt your heart in this matter. And I confess it to you, Lord, and I ask for forgiveness. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Please, God. And as we are intentional about this, 
And as we come before God with a broken, the Bible says, a broken, a contrite heart, God will not despise. So after we've done that, what is the next step? After we have recognized that the foundation of cleansing is only by the blood, nothing else. It's only by intentional, sincere, deep-hearted repentance and confession unto God, right? After that, what next? And that's why I said, the filling then comes after the blood, the cleansing by the blood, the confession of our sins, and the filling now comes through what I call familiarity and fellowship with the Holy Spirit through prayer and through the word and through spiritual exercise. Amen? Through deeper familiarity and fellowship with the Holy Spirit through prayer through the word and through spiritual exercise. Through prayer, through the word, and through spiritual exercise. Let's look at let's look at prayer. How can a person be filled with the Holy Spirit through prayer? Listen to what Jesus said. We already look at that. We already looked at Acts chapter four and verse thirty-one passage, right? But let's let's look at what Jesus said. Luke chapter eleven and verse number thirteen. He says, "If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children." How much more shall your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Oh, my God. If you being evil, Luke, this is Luke chapter, chapter 11 and verse number 13. If you being evil, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Oh, my God. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Beloved, do you know that? I mean, there's no way There's no way to rule it out. There is no way. There's no way to rule it out. Prayerfulness is, an, is a must for anyone who wants to walk in the Spirit. Prayerfulness is a must. If you don't believe me, look at how the church was born. There was a promise from Jesus. Stay in Jerusalem until you receive the promise from my father. The Bible says that while they were in Jerusalem, what were they doing on the day of Pentecost? They were praying in one accord. That's what they were doing. They were praying in one accord. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were the place they were gathered, there was the sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And the place where they were, they, they were, well, I want to read this stuff. I want to read this stuff. We go to Acts chapter chapter 1. I don't want to read Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Uh, let me just find this real quick. It's Acts chapter 1 and verse number 14. Good. There is it. So it lists from verse 13 all of this, the, the, the guys who are in the upper room. And they were come. Oh, no, I want to read it. See for good juice. No, I don't want to read it for good juice. All right. And after entering Jerusalem, now, notice now Jesus going to heaven and he gave them a, he gave them an instruction. He so they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called all of that verse 12, which is near Jerusalem, being about a distance of a Sabbath day's journey. And after entering Jerusalem, they went up into the upper chamber where there was both Peter and James, where Peter and James were staying, and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Jude, the brother of James. What were they doing? Verse 14 answers that question. All of these were steadfastly continuing with one accord in prayer and supplication together with the women, including Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. 
They were there praying. They were there praying in one accord. So by the time you come to Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1, it says, now Peter and John, um, Acts chapter 2, it says, and Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together again with one accord in that place. So from chapter 1, verse 14, the one accordness was the one accordness of prayer. Doesn't mean they were not doing anything else, but the primary reason why they were there was praying. They were praying, they were praying, they were praying. And so they were all together in one accord in the same place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And, and, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared like divided tongues of fire. At this, at, and it sat upon all of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. My God. Beloved, I cannot stress this enough. There is no way that anyone wants to truly experience the controlling influence, the filling of God's power in your life. And if you're not prayerful, you're not going to happen. So think about it like a think about it like a like a like a like a of a, 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 a like a um, broken cycle. That if I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit with more of the Holy Spirit, I have to pray more. And the more I pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, one sign that the Holy Spirit's filling will happen is that I will not stop praying more. I will have a desire to pray more. The high works. Am I making sense? Are you there? It's a cycle that if I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, after I have after I have agreed with God and I have prayed and asked God to cleanse me and confess everything and stuff like that, right? And I am praying for God to fill me with God's Spirit. The more I pray, the more I pray, the more I pray, the more of God's Spirit will be impressed upon my heart. Watch this. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. This is the promise of God. He says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the house of, of and, uh, and upon the people of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the people of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace, beloved, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prayer. Supplication is prayer. So if we must experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which, what again, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is what? Is the controlling influence of God in my life, right? Where I'm able to hear God, where I'm able to receive power from God to walk in obedience to God. That means I have to walk in prayer, prayerfulness. And the more I walk in prayer, the proof, the fruit by which I will know that the Spirit of God has filled me is the fact that I will continue to want to walk in, continue to walk in prayer. You don't, you don't, you don't, you, we don't experience the, full, the, 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 the influence, the filling influence of the Holy Spirit. And then we say, yeah, I got enough now for two more weeks. I ain't talking to the Holy Spirit for the next two more weeks. Chill. You can be done and, 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 and I can go do something else. No, it doesn't work like that. So what are we saying? We say, how can a person receive this refilling? They get back understanding the foundation of, for, of forgiveness, which is the blood of the Lamb, which is by sincere, genuine, wholehearted confession. And we said that confession means agreeing with God. And we said third, it is by a deeper and a deeper familiarity and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which comes number one through prayer. Through the word and through spiritual exercise. Praise the Lord. So prayer is the benchmark. Prayer is one benchmark. There is no way you can disconnect. Prayer and the Holy Spirit's feeling is, is, is interwoven, intertwined, interconnected forever and ever. The one who wants to express more of the Holy Spirit, you got to be in a place where the Holy Spirit is. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abound in the shadow of the Almighty. You got to be in a secret place of the Lord. You got to want to be in the presence of God. You got It's a desire. God will not force his way into your life. Again, Jesus said a thing. He said, if you know, fathers, you parents, you know how to give good gifts to your children, right? No child of yours will come and ask you for, for, for bread and you give him a stone. No child of yours will come and ask you for fish and you give him a serpent. Wicked as we are, we will not do that. 
He said, how much more about the father whose heart is more tender than ours, more compassionate than ours? Do you think that the father will not give his spirit to them to ask him? That's what he's saying. He will not give the spirit to them to ask him. So if I'm saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit so that, Lord, I can walk in obedience to you, that, Lord, I can see clearly, I can grow in discernment, I can understand your word, I can understand your will, I can be able to live and fulfill my purpose, I can be able to tap into the blessing that heaven has for my name, and I will not miss it, that I'll be able to win and, and be victorious in spiritual warfare. Because it's not about might, it's not about power, it's about my spirit. He said, do you think that the Father will not do it? So that feeling comes through, the, through prayerfulness consistency in the place of prayer and beloved sometimes yeah there's sometimes i know we may not feel like praying right but even when you don't feel like praying sometimes just admitting to god like god i ain't feel like praying today but lord i know i need to pray holy spirit help me to pray my god you don't even know what kind of power you can unleash by saying that where you where you are able to admit to yourself and say god i don't feel like praying today I don't know why, but in my spirit, I know I don't feel like praying today, but I know I need to pray. Father, I pray that your spirit will unleash grace upon me right now and, the, and unleash that, that spirit of prayer upon my life right now so that I can be in that space, that place where you want me to be. Woo! You don't know the kind of powers that you can unrivel, that you can release in a cosmic realm, in the spiritual dimensions in your life when you make that kind of true and heartfelt prayer unto God. Amen. So, through a deeper, the feeling comes through a deeper familiarity and fellowship with the Holy Spirit through what? Prayer. Because prayerfulness is connected to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from prayerfulness. Now, next is through the word. You may remember Jesus said something. He said, sanctify, John 17, 17. Sanctify them in your truth. And then he said, your word is true. Now, again, one other function of the Holy Spirit, one other ministry of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us. The word sanctify means to keep us pure. It means to keep us on the right path. Now, if the word is what it would take for the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. If the word is what we, is used to set us apart for the purpose of God, then prayer alone will not do it. No matter how much we pray, prayer alone will not do it. You can pray and get done praying, and then you can still be misguided and go the wrong direction and still grieve the Holy Spirit. So, Walking in the light, walking in the set of partners, which is what sanctif sanctification is, right? Walking in the apartness of the Holy Spirit, beloved, is the next critical thing if we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, sanctify them in your truth. That word is truth. That's John 17, 17. Jesus says something about, about, about the word also. He said, for the word that I speak unto you is spirit. John chapter 6 and verse 63. He said, it is a spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Then he said, the word that I speak unto you, this word is spirit and this word is life. I see beloved, I see, I see Christian people. I see Christian people not passionate for this word. We can spend hours watching movies. We can spend hours doing different things, having festivities and parties and all those things. But to spend an hour under the word, spend an hour in the word, we don't have time. Jesus said, it is the spirit that gives life. It is the spirit that gives life. The, the flesh, this physical body, this physical material thing, it profit nothing insofar as the spirit of God is concerned. And Jesus said something. He said, the word I speak unto you, this word is spirit, and this word is life. When we stand to declare the word of God, we are actually connecting you with dimensions of spiritual realities. That's what we are doing. Now, Jesus said something in John. He said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will reveal all truth unto you. He will bring to your remembrance, my God. 
That is why the word is the second most important thing beside prayer that will help you to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Because if the Spirit of God is convincing you to do something and directing you to do something, or if the Spirit of God is calling you not to do a thing, how can you be sure that it's not your own feelings? How can you be certain that this is not, in fact, even Satan speaking to you? The way to know that is by the convincement of the Word of God. Because the Holy Spirit has no commitment to speak any other word to you other than the Word of God, other than the Word of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's commitment to speak to our heart is to speak by reason of the word. Hence, if we have the word stored in our heart that we may not sin against him, when we hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us, there will be a there will be an agreement, there will be a confirmation. Because it will be our spirits agreeing with his spirit that we are children of the most high God. The word of God, number two, critical. No, there, there is no if and end about it. No if and end. Number one is prayer. Number two is the word. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, spend time in the word. Spend time in prayer and spend time in the word. And then number three, we say, we're closing with this. Familiarity and deeper fellowship with the Holy Spirit through what I call spiritual exercise. Spiritual exercise is simply, spiritual exercise is simply, all right, think about it like this. You've done all the prayer you can pray. You've done all the Bible reading you can read. All the Bible memorization you have memorized, right? All of the meditation on the word, all the you know memorization of the scriptures and all of that, right? Spiritual exercise is going to put it into practice. That, that Simply, that's what I mean. Spiritual exercise is now, God, I'm go, as I leave your presence, as I leave from... This intimate moment that I'm having with you, as I leave this worship experience and as I get out there, now it's the battlefield of testing this method that you have just given to me. I promise you, if you if you have that mentality and you stepped out of your closet, your prayer closet, and you step out of your, your devotional closet, you have just read your, the word of God. You just spent time in the, in the presence of God. When you get out there with this mindset, knowing that, okay, God, when I leave your presence, it's about going to do business. It's going to do battle. Watch this. The enemy will start to attack you. And when the enemy starts attacking you, before you can do another thing, the Holy Spirit will remind you about what you need to know and what you need to do. So spiritual exercise is simply going out from the presence of God with the commitment to put into practice what God has put inside of you. The Spirit of God will deposit a word inside of you and that commitment to live it out. <coughs> Excuse me. That commitment to live it out is the exercise. It's exercising the spiritual benefits and spiritual blessings of, of what the Lord has given to us. Yes. Spiritual exercise can also include fasting. And again, who says? God can tell you to spend, spend more time with me in prayer and fasting. That's a spiritual exercise. God can tell you, take some time to meditate on my word. Meditating on the word of God means taking it and, and doing a deep reflection about it and, and, and looking at it intensely, trying to understand every aspect of it. Because when you are so engaged with it, you are in tune, you are open. God can start dropping some nuggets of truth in your spirit to take you to another level of understanding. All of those are spiritual exercises. But the crux of spiritual exercise is going out into the world to do what? To put into practice what God has deposited on the inside of you. And beloved, these are the means. These are the, these are the, the, the biblical prescriptions by which we can experience the infilling of God's spirit if we have lost it. I want to ask you today, when you think about yourself and you think about your walk with the Lord, are you passionate again and on fire for God like it used to be? Do you see yourself yearning more and more and more for God? Like, I want to, God, I want to know more of you. I want to. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and I will seek after that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life to, to, to inquire in his tabernacle, to, to grow in his will. Is that a thing for you? As the deer thirsts, pets for the waters, my soul thirsts for you, God. Is that is that a reality for you? If not, 
Could it be that we have quenched the spirit of God at some point in our life? Do we yearn for a revival? Do we know that revival can begin with us? First of all, we acknowledge that the blood is eternally effective. The blood of Jesus is eternally effective. Jesus died to liberate us from that, from that feeling of deadness to that place of power and that place of, of fellowship and fire. Do you know, do we know that we can go to God in our prayer closet and say, God, I've been running away from you. You've been convicting me. You've been convincing me that I needed to get things right with you, but I've been running away from you. I hear your word today, God. I'm, I'm stopping in my tracks. I'm getting down on my face, prostrating before you, and I'm saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I raise my hands before you, and I call those things by name before you, the thing that your word commanded me not to do, but God, that I went about doing anyway, that I broke the covenant I had with you, God, and I'm confessing it to you. Do you know? Do, do we know that when we do that, there can be a mighty power that can shift in the realm of the spirit and break some shackles and break some yokes concerning our life? That there can be a disconnection of that blockade that will hold in the floodgate of God's spirit, and it can it can be it can be pulled out of the way so that so that there can be a mighty outpouring of God's spirit in our life. And then familiarity, and then that, and then and then that that drive to be familiar with the Holy Spirit again, that drive to grow in fellowship again by spending time in the presence of God in prayer, spending time in the Word of God, spending time in 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 in, in, in God's presence to the point that when we are done with that, we can get up and say, "Okay, now God has moved out into the world. I go out with a, with the commitment." to be sensitive to, to your spirit, to be in tune, because I know that the moment I leave your presence and I get out there, temptation will come. But I don't want to operate on my, in my usual self. I want to operate based on your influence over my life, which is what the infilling of the Holy Spirit is. Do we know that when we walk like this, we can experience power like never before? Yeah. And this is what God is offering us. This is what God is offering us. It's available to every child of God who will take this word seriously and apply it. I heard the word of God say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be delivered. That means that man, that woman, that brother, God, who, who will take this word seriously and say, God, I'm coming to you because I want to experience an infilling. I know that I've lost that fullness, that power. I don't, I don't see, I don't sense your presence moving me, stirring my heart like it used to. And now, God, I want, I want that. I, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't restore to me the joy of your salvation. Somebody needs to be praying that prayer today. Somebody needs to be praying that prayer today. And I can guarantee you that the Bible tells us that where the presence of the Lord is, there is fullness of joy. It is a joy that is not contingent upon material things. It is a joy that's not contingent upon who knows your name. It is not a, 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 a joy that's, that's based upon who like you or who don't like you no it's a joy that is deep rooted and deep founded in knowing that you are living your purpose and you are walking in line with your purpose beloved may the lord may the lord grant us a feeling may the lord grant us grant us a desire for a feeling beginning today may the lord cause everything every foundation that is required to be laid so that we can experience a feeling the filling of God's Holy Spirit, may the Lord cause those, those dimensions to be to be reorchestrated, realigned. And may the Lord grant us grace so that our spirits cannot be stubborn, our hearts cannot be hardened against the Lord. But I will be humble enough to run to God and say, Lord, I need you. Fill me again. Fill me again. I'm so grateful to God for this privilege that we had to be on here tonight. We're thankful to God for, we're thankful to God for what we've been able to share. Um, I pray that there has been something here that has blessed you. I pray, I pray deeply from my heart that God will amplify this word in your spirit and that you will own it and cherish it for the rest of your life. And that God will build, build you up in this word and grant you an inheritance in the name of Jesus. Any questions, any comments so we can wrap it up? Do we have any questions, any comment so that we can wrap it up? Do we have any questions or any comments so that we can wrap up our time?
If not, then we'll just like to say thank you to all of you who were there. Minister Maria Phillips, um, Mother Melissa Bleedy, Sister Natasha Freeman, um, every one of you who have been on here, we just bless God for you. And it's our prayer, Mother Priscilla Jaina. We bless God for you and we pray that the Lord will continue to increase you and strengthen you in Jesus' mighty name. We will pray and bring this time to a close in Jesus' name. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your word, which is true, and your word, which is life. God, we, we realize tonight, our Father, without the filling of your spirit, God, we can never be as effective like, we des like you desire for us to be. Father God, we do know that, Lord, the flesh is still having a strong pull on us. We know that the world, the world still has a, a, a strong gravitational pull upon us. We know that the enemy of our souls still have a strong pull upon us. And, Lord, we cannot break free from this pull. We cannot break free, Lord, to be the best version of who you've created us to be without your spirit. For, Lord, it is not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit, saith the Lord. So, Father God, we confess to you tonight every grieving act that we may have committed to grieve your spirit. And every quenching act, oh God, that we may have done to, to quench your spirit, we confess them to you tonight with sincerity of heart with brokenness of spirit, and we say, Lord, blot out our transgressions and cleanse us from our sins. Father God, please don't let this be a cliche. Lord, let this be the, the sincerest expression of our heart crying out to you. Openly tonight as we make this confession, our Lord, we need your grace and we need your mercy. Let the blood of the Lamb cleanse us tonight. Let the Spirit of God reposition us in our place of fellowship. And Father God, we pray that there will be an opening of the floodgates of your spirit. You said those that believe in you out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. God, let there be an avalanche. Let there be an, a massive outpouring of your spirit to influence and control and lead and guide us. Father God, help us to be sensitive not to walk in our own way, but to do what you are requiring us to do. We thank you again for joy. And we thank you again for peace. And we thank you again for strength and power. We thank you again for grace. Be glorified tonight and in the days to come in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So just before we get up here, just before we get up here, we just like to say um, today's a special day in the life of our church, in the life of the First International Baptist Church in Trenton. And it's a special day for us because we have a couple of young people who are graduating today. And we said we needed we needed the names of those that are graduating just so that we can we can celebrate them on our Rema encounter tonight. And so we're gonna try to do that. Um, first of all, we we have on our list um, Musa Kamara. He graduated, and we thank God for him. Very athletic, very athletic young man. We bless God for him and his his pursuit in academics, but also his pursuit in his athletic development. And we pray that God will open doors for him. Um, of course, our own darling, darling Evangeline Roberts is also, she's also graduating, um, stepping up, stepping up from elementary to middle school. Yep, yep, yep. That is phenomenal. That is amazing. Um, and then um, Jay Zobon, J Jason, J uh, Joyson, Zabon is also graduating today from middle school. He's going um to he's going on to I think uh, high school. I think it is. He graduated. He graduated. He's going on to high school, and we thank God for him. Um, I think those are for now. Those are the three names that we have who are graduating. And we just like to thank God for them and for their families. We pray that God will continue to bless and strengthen them. We pray God's guidance upon their academic career. And we know that they will do well in Jesus' name. Um, did I? I hope I didn't leave anybody. Or oh, please, if I left anybody, or oh, it was completely an oversight. Um, 
yeah, I think that's it. I think those are the deals that I that I that I have so far. So yes, we just thank God for our graduates, our young graduates. I know there are a few more coming up, like uh, Sister KCP Body. She's gonna be graduating. Um, she's gonna be getting getting her BSc right, if I'm getting that correct. And we bless God for her. But we will get those details and we we'll, we'll most definitely celebrate them to get on subsequent um, broadcasts on our Rayma Encounter. We thank God for what we've had for the time that we've had to be on here tonight. And we pray that there has been something that we shared that was a blessing to you. And we thank God so much for you. So the Lord bless you and keep you in these difficult times. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you. And the Lord grant you his peace. And the Lord cause you to walk in the fullness of the power of God's spirit in Jesus' name. Until we come here again on next week, Wednesday, with another edition of our Rima Encounter. I have been your Bible facilitator, Bible teacher sitting here in the seat. But the Holy Spirit has been our teacher, and I'm Pastor Victor Cohen saying have a blessed evening. God bless you. The Lord loves you. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.